Well, this same sort of thing that we're doing intuitively here with the coin flips is exactly what we're doing in terms of hypothesis testing. But what we do is we set up a priori, or beforehand, what number of heads would I need to find to say, that's too unlikely. I'm going to call out my roommate and say that this coin is unfair. Well, what we do is we set some sort of criterion or threshold or cutoff, at which point we say, if I see any number of heads greater than this number, I'm going to call that too unlikely. So let's say that we set a cutoff in this situation and say anything with greater than seven heads, in other words, if eight, nine, or ten heads show up on this coin, I'm going to call that too unlikely. Well, this is exactly what we're doing when we do hypothesis testing in behavioral science. Where we would come up with this value is to say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up with a certain percentage of outcomes that are too unlikely. And as you know, we typically use about 5%. This is our alpha level of 0.05. So what we say is, okay, well, the 5% most unlikely outcomes are the ones that I'm going to use as evidence to say, I think that this coin isn't fair or I think my null hypothesis is incorrect. And so with the cutoff that we've drawn here, the reason that we've chosen this location is because values of 8, 9, or 10 collectively produce right around 5% of the most unlikely outcomes. Okay? In other words, if we add up the values of the blue bars associated with 8, 9, and 10, we're going to see it comes to actually a little bit over 5%. But for the sake of argument right now, let's just, let's just go with this situation. Okay. So what we've done is we've set this cutoff. And we've said, OK, before we even flip the coin once, I'm going to say beforehand that if I get 8, 9, or 10 heads out of 10, I'm going to question or doubt that this coin is fair. I'm going to reject the hypothesis, the null hypothesis of a fair coin. And I'm going to take this as evidence for my research hypothesis that the coin is not fair. Okay, well, this embodies the concepts that we talk about all the time. In particular, this cutoff that we've established, this black line, corresponds to the critical value that we talk about. In this case, the critical value would be 8 heads or greater in terms of the number of coin flips. You can think about the probability of all of the outcomes greater than this cutoff, greater than the critical value, is exactly, as I mentioned before, what we call our alpha value. Okay, the total amount in terms of probability that we would say are too unlikely to have occurred if the null hypothesis is true. So now you can see how the critical value, which is a cutoff, relates to the level alpha, which is a probability. In particular, the cutoff critical value determines how much probability is beyond this specific cutoff value, which is exactly what we call alpha. Now, what we can also do is to think about, well, what is the probability associated with any specific outcome? In other words, given this same scenario, one last term that we can define, or make very concrete, is what we've been calling the p-value. Okay, now, the p-value isn't the probability of one specific outcome, but let's go back to looking at an outcome of six heads in the current situation. What we can then do is to say, Okay, well, what is the probability of getting six heads or more? What if we moved our, moved our cutoff, for example, down to, say, uh, some number between five and six? In other words, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten are the values in which we're now interested. Well, we can do the same thing, and we can look at what is the total or cumulative probability associated with values six, seven, eight, nine, or ten. In other words, we can add up the probability of obtaining an outcome of six or greater. Okay. And if we do that, this is exactly what we would call our p-value. So let's say that we actually found six heads after flipping it ten times. Our p-value in this case, the way that we talk about it with hypothesis testing, would be 0.377. Because that's the probability of obtaining an outcome like the one that we did, six heads. Specifically, it's the probability of obtaining six heads or greater given the null hypothesis. Now with this p-value of 0.377, what that means is, if I flip a fair coin 10 times, then over a third of the time, about 37 or 38 percent of the time, I am going to get at least six heads, if not more. Now that is in a situation that I would call very unlikely. And so in this situation, 
I'm not very likely to reject that null hypothesis of it being a fair coin. Okay? In other words, because the probability associated with the outcome that I found is greater than that 5% alpha cutoff that I established. In this case, it's a probability of 0.377. In this case, I'm also going to fail to reject my null hypothesis. And you'll see this is because my obtained outcome of 6 was less than my cutoff or critical value of 8, which means that my p-value, my probability, was greater than the alpha probability which I established before. Okay, so there's really two different ways to conceptualize this, and I know this trips people up sometimes. We establish a cutoff in terms of probability, which is our alpha, in this case 5%. That determines a cutoff corresponding to the actual values we're dealing with, that is number of heads, which in this case was saying eight or more heads was going to be our cutoff, our critical value in this case. Okay. So we really have a choice. We can either compare the outcome that we found, six heads, to our critical value of eight, and if we didn't get a value greater than that critical value, then we're going to retain our null hypothesis. Or we can care the, compare the probability that we got, our p-value of 0.377, to our cutoff probability, which is alpha, of 0.05. Now in this case what we're looking for is a p-value that's less than alpha of 0.05. But in this situation again because our p-value is greater than alpha then we would fail to reject that null hypothesis or we would retain that null hypothesis. In other words our conclusion would be six heads out of ten that's not too unlikely. That's not sufficient for me to question whether or not this coin is actually a fair coin. Now Unfortunately, in behavioral science, we don't typically have access to this perfect distribution where we know exactly what we should expect. So, when we're dealing with human behavior, okay, there's a little bit more left up to, to chance in terms of whether or not the conclusions that we're drawing are indeed going to generalize to the population. So let's think again about an example of how this might actually apply in behavioral science. Let's look at our simplest situation where we can use z-scores to do hypothesis testing because that's where we're going to start when we move into looking at groups or samples to do hypothesis testing okay, starting in lecture and over the next couple weeks here in 294. So we know that the Z distribution or standard normal distribution can be obtained from any set of raw scores. So if I have a set of raw scores X then what I can do is to subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation in that set of raw scores to transform that set of scores into z-scores or transform them into the standard normal distribution that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Well now we can apply the same logic that I just covered in the coin flip example to this situation here because this is just any other distribution that we have. So now we have a distribution of scores here. Okay. The height of the distribution represents the relative frequency or probability, okay, density technically, as it's called, probability density of obtaining these different scores. And we're going to do the same thing that we did before. We're going to set a cutoff to say, okay, well what I may do is to say, what are going to be the most extreme values of this standard normal distribution? So what I might do is to set a cutoff like this one here and say, that those extreme scores up at the top, the most extreme 5% of scores, are the ones I'm going to call too unlikely. Well, because we know specifically the standard normal distribution and the area or probability associated with every value in this distribution, then we can work backwards and identify, through tables like the one in your textbook, that it's a value of 1.65 that's going to give us 5% of the distribution greater than the black line. So when this cutoff is set at 1.65, we know that is the value for which 5% of the scores, or 5% of the distribution, is greater. That sets off the most extreme or most unlikely set of scores, if you will. Now, if not just the upper tail of the distribution is important to consider, but we also want to consider the lower tail. In other words, we're not just looking for the most extreme top scores here, or high scores, but also the extreme scores on the other side, the extreme low scores, 
Then what we have to do is to allocate not 5% to the top and 5% to the bottom, because that would give us a total of 10%, but we want to take that 5% most extreme that we're concerned with and partition that and put 2.5% at the top, 2.5% at the bottom, so that we still have a total of the 5% most extreme scores, but now acknowledging that some of those could be way up high and some of those could be way down low. Now in this situation, our cutoff value, we know, again judging from the tables in your book, are values of positive or negative 1.96. In other words, if I find a z-score greater than 1.96 or less than negative 1.96, those are the types of values that I'm going to call too extreme to have been likely to come from this standard normal distribution. So then what we can do is to take any population of scores and if we transform it into the standard normal distribution it's very easy to determine whether or not the z-score associated with any single value of x is likely or not to have come from that distribution. So again, let's close here with a concrete example. And again, this is one that I've introduced in the past before in 293, so the data may look familiar to some of you.